So let's take a journey back to the 1990s. Gaming was not what it is now. Uh, if you wanted to play an arcade game, you could certainly go play Donkey Kong or Ms. Pac-Man or Centipede at uh, your local arcade. But if you wanted to play a game on the computer, it was a little bit sketchier. Uh, you didn't have the first-person shooters. That was not even a thing. Real-time strategy games were not a thing. Computer games, uh, at best, sort of simulated arcade games, and at worst were Pong. Then along comes a company called Viacom, and what they did is they created a sort of choose-your-own-adventure style of gaming. At first they did a few Sherlock Holmes type of games, and then in 1993 they released Dracula Unleashed. This was also in the choose-your-own-adventure style. It was sometimes referred to as an interactive movie because you would watch actors on screen portraying scenes that you would choose for them to uh, experience. Dracula Unleashed was massively successful at its time. At the moment, it was the top-selling game of all time, and it was the first time Dracula became a character brought into the computer gaming world. Obviously, Castlevania and things like that had existed already, but for computer gaming, for PC gaming, Dracula was making his first appearance with Dracula Unleashed. And the influence can still be found. If you go online and just type it in, you can find chat rooms that are dedicated to this game. Uh, there are plenty of walkthroughs and emulators that have been created. People loved this game at the time. Well, today we have the director of Dracula Unleashed, Mike Plant, is going to be joining us. And Mike Plant is going to discuss what Dracula Unleashed meant to him, what it was like to make that game. Sometimes we, we uh, slip up in the course of this interview and we called it a movie because that's kind of what it was, and what the influence is of it today. So without further delay, welcome Mike Plant. Uh, Mike, you are the director of a video game. People don't usually think of directors in video games, but what was different about Dracula Unleashed from the 90s that required an actual director? People are amazed now because they think of uh, Call of Duty and... and uh, Grand Theft Auto and these other games that have these open worlds, but the animation's great, the cutscenes are great. Well, this was really, these were really the first uh, open world kind of discovery video games ever made. But rather than having a lot of money for animation, we had to shoot, uh, or got to shoot, live motion uh, capture with actors. Now, since it was in the infancy, the Sherlock Holmes was you could barely even move like this because it would slow down the game processor. So a lot of, and it's part of why we went with Sherlock Holmes with the first one, because, you know, it's a very analytical, you know, obviously a series of books and the game is the same where it's more uh, mind puzzles to solve who the murderer was. Over time, after the three uh, games of Sherlock Holmes went out, we were far more confident that we could do chase scenes and uh, vampires turning into wolves that could jump through the scene without it jittering in a stop motion kind of way. So we were able to do full uh, 30 frames a second stop motion video in this game. And it was very much in the feeling of Dark Shadows or the Hammer films of vampire movies that were also well known. And so it's uh, taken seriously, but with a little bit of a wink at times that mm -hmm. we're all in this having fun. For us, it was like shooting a movie. Well, and, it is a movie. It's, it's almost like a choose-your-own-adventure movie. It, it is completely like that. Uh, the writer of the game uh, was very beholden to Bram Stoker's Dracula. And as, as you know, that book is very much written like a journal. Mm -hmm. And uh, this game is very much written like a journal. It's the journal of Alexander Morris, the brother of Quincy Morris, who, as you know, uh, helped Jonathan Harker kill Dracula in the book, spoiler alert. <laughs> and uh, Alexander Morris comes to London to find out what, how did his brother die, what happened, and that's the conceit of the game is, it's a little bit like a sequel, if you will, to the book, where it's got a lot of the similar characters from the book, but it's a couple years later, so uh, people that love Bram Stoker's Dracula can embrace the whole uh, scenario because they know a lot of these characters, but it's a fresh take because there's a new character. 
And speaking of Embrace, you can go online and you can find so many people who remember this movie fondly. And it seems like if you can find someone who played the game, I said movie, but that's because they marketed it as an interactive movie. The game in the 90s when it came out, you can just see their eyes star over and they're like, oh, how much I love Dracula Unleashed. And I, they'll go and look at the screen grabs and you can see the flood of memories come back to them. You are exactly right. In fact, uh, I was just at a actor's party that a good friend of ours, Pete, threw about a month ago. And tons of actors there, and it's all reminiscing. And Donna Werner, who was in uh, the game, says she still gets a lot of emails and texts uh, via YouTube, or they find her email account about how big a fan they are of Dracula Unleashed many, many, many years later. And she was not even one of the stars. She was about the eighth or ninth uh, bit player in there. She was Mina Harker, who obviously is huge in the book, not as big a character because uh, there's a number of other new characters in the game. But, and I said, same thing. I still get seven or eight emails a year from fans that, well, is there ever going to be a sequel? You know, can't stop playing this. Uh, I've had to keep my old computer alive just because you know, it's the easiest and best way to play this game. So it's very rewarding that this, you know, touched so many people in an era now when we can't touch people with coronavirus. <laughs> you could very easily take what you shot for the game and just make it a movie, right? Completely. In fact, there was some talk about repurposing that uh, for because at the time this is when this this thing called cable TV was kind of in its infancy. Heard of it. Heard of it. Yeah. Heard of it. And the producer was saying he thought maybe we would just take everything up until the denouement uh, and turn it into uh, basically about an hour long uh, promo or episode or that 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 could a pilot that would entice people not just to learn more and to find out how it all ends, but perhaps to entice people to uh, ask for a whole nother uh, game to be created. Because it's the, the, the sort of choose your own adventure style of gaming, there's a lot of ways that you could play the game several different times and have different experiences. But there's, am I right in thinking there's only one way the game ends? Unless, no, unless you die and, and mess up? No, there's multiple ways it can end. So since it's uh, composed like a journal, uh, it's it's even clock driven. So that along with the journal entries, uh, based on what time of day, and there's a clock that's that's up in the corner on the screen, there's places you can go and people you can interact with at 8 a.m. or 11 a.m. that you can't find at 4 p.m. or mm -hmm. 7 so it's it's not only an open it's an it's an open world but an open world that is time bound so you have to be at certain places at certain times of the day for anything to happen and that includes even the ending you could do everything right get to the ending uh, or near the ending but if you're there at the wrong time of day sure it won't be a good ending so there are definitely multiple endings so so anyone who hasn't played the game can probably guess that the sun plays a bit of a role in the ending the brother no no the sun son oh the sun son uh maybe could be and by maybe i mean yes well speaking of that uh without giving away the ending talk about the religious uh imagery that gets used in dracula unleashed because you guys leaned real heavily on uh religious iconography we definitely did and uh the producer was a very religious guy and it, it was probably a good balance because I'm very much not a religious guy. So uh, we we did a friendly battle a lot with how much uh, religion iconography we would go in it or not. There's certainly a lot of use of crosses. There's a lot of times when crosses work. There's a lot of times when crosses don't work. Again, depending on what else the player has accomplished during the game, Mm -hmm. what time of day you're using the crosses, how you're using the crosses, what you're using the crosses with. Uh, there's there's obviously rosary beads that sometimes can help, sometimes do nothing. So there's certainly, it, it can certainly be 
a valuable asset and or weapon, uh, religious iconography, but it is not always. And being the sharp-eyed director that you are, did you plan to have a literal cross behind you right now as you're saying this that is being cast by the sun? I did the not. shadow of the window. That is just uh, divine intervention. I, I like it, that you don't, you I, don't even turn around to check that I'm saying this. I, uh, I, it's, it's, I assure you it's right there. <laughs> Alanis Morissette would call it ironic, no doubt. Uh, would she be using ironic correctly? I don't know that anything in that song is correctly <laughs> correct use of uh, irony. The key is correct. The key is correct. Uh, why did your company decide to make this particular game? What else was going on in the world of gaming at the time? What else was going on in, in just uh, entertainment media at the time that they said, Dracula is the game that we have to make right now? Uh, well, part of it was, uh, well, first off, a Dracula is a timeless story. And uh, there's been so many movies, uh, so many TV shows that don't specifically reference Dracula, but Vampire Diaries and all these other kind of things that have gone on that it, uh, the producers always realized that there was an audience for this. While we were shooting the Sherlock Holmes games and they were well received uh, and, and sold very well, uh, we heard a hint that Francis Ford Coppola was starting to think about doing uh, Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula movie. And uh, the moment our executive producer, Ken Trolla, heard, you know, these homes, things are selling great, but this might be the time to do something totally different. How about Dracula? Well, this was uh, 89, just uh, started 90 when we had heard about it. Actually, Bram Stoker's Dracula didn't come out till I believe, 93. Uh, Coppola's 92 maybe it doesn't it, yeah somewhere in there it probably was the final catalyst where Viacom said now's the time to embrace this uh and he was right eventually when it came out it was the first video game of its time to make over a million dollars now the games nowadays like uh Witcher 3 which makes over a billion dollars. Yeah, there's a huge market now. But this was back when a million dollars meant something. Well, not everybody had a desktop computer back then or a gaming system that could play it. So, yeah, that was a big deal. And also, I think that might have been the first game to introduce Dracula into the computer gaming world. There's been, there's been a lot since, and I think there were even some more that year. Uh, but I think yours came first. Right. I, I believe I believe so as well. It, it was, and our game did wind up getting finished before the movie came out. And as a quasi rap party, uh, pretty much all the crew and most of the actors we went all all went to uh, opening night to Bram Stoker's Dracula to kind of help celebrate. Appropriate. Yeah. Wait, Dracula can be kind of a divisive figure. Did, did you find that in the production of this there were divisions and? how this is going to get made and the proper way to, to treat the characters in the story or anything like that? The, the game is more a search and discovery for what is even going on, because there's a lot going on in the game. It's more than just a search for Dracula. There's a lot of other people affected that become vampires. He, he wants to, the, the hero, Alexander Morris, is trying to save all these people. So it's it's as much about saving the people from also becoming vampires as it is about the end game of finding uh, who Dracula is and where he is. And there's a mystery element to it. There's there's multiple mystery elements to it. Which I'm, you sure, know, which I'm sure you were familiar are, with because you just made three Sherlock Holmes games right before that. Well, right. And and there, there's numerous mystery, just like any... My, my wife loves the game Witcher, Witcher 3. She's played it all the way through twice. And part of it is the game is not just to do one thing. Like many video games, the game is to uh, solve a million riddles along the way mm -hmm. and a million tasks and the little, you know, little mini uh, journeys. And that's exactly what the video game is, too. There's, there's a, a, you know, like a lot of video games, there's, there's keys you have to find before you can go in to the alchemist's uh, store to be able to find the right potion that will help your fiance not die, that could then allow her to tell you a certain thing that would lead you to something else. So 
it's all uh, interrelated. Well, I think, like me, you probably appreciate some smashing and fighting in a video game, but the problem solving is really the thing that makes you sit up late at night and think about it. And it's the reason you can't wait to get back to playing that game again. It's not because you're driving a car real fast or, or shooting a bunch of people. It's because you, there's a problem that has to be solved before you can go on to the next thing. And at least for me, that's what really gets in my head. And it's probably what appeals to most people who play these games so incessantly, I think. You're, you're exactly right. And uh, one of the advantages that we all embraced was because there was a lot of real actors in it at a, in a time when, you know, a big game at the time was like Pitfall. And, you know, uh, these games that were just 8-bit video games. Right. Just little that, arcade games, yeah. Yeah, so it was hard to relate to these, you know, Miss Pac-Man is a hottie, but you can't relate to her too much, right? So the, we, we tried to give each of the actors and actresses through lines so that they weren't just saying lines. There was a backstory to every one of them. And in fact, we wrote backstories so that every one of them knew not just what they were doing in that scene. Here's what you did the last five years of your life. And this is what's going to be what motivates you to do the next seven things in this video game because you're motivated by past history. Well, it is at the time it was so unlike the video games that people were used to. What was your template? What you and the writers, how did you wrap your head around what this was going to eventually be when the only video games anyone was playing was King Kong, or, excuse me, Donkey Kong and Pac-Man and games like that? Well, the, the real template was Bram Stoker's book in terms of a, a template, in terms of how it would branch out. Because we learned a lot from the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective series, we, we knew how the connective tissue to make you know, everything enticing enough that a player would want to keep going. But the truth was, it was an open canvas because there weren't that there, there, there weren't that many other things to bounce off. We didn't have to worry about uh, plagiarism because there was nobody to plagiarize from. So it was more a trial and error kind of thing. Now in hindsight, would we have done some other things differently? Yeah, but we, we went with the technology we had at the time, the budget we had at the time, and and we kind of guessed. I mean, obviously, it was very well laid out with what went to what, and there was this whole big blueprint manual that the uh, producer had. But we were just kind of spitballing it. What do you think that uh, Dracula Unleashed was giving to gamers at that time that they weren't getting before? A, a, a human connection. I really do believe that because of the actors and, and the stop motion, they, it gave them more of a reason to care, care about characters than just if they were little 8-bit icons. They, they would get more invested in the storyline and, and who's on screen. Uh, the Rock doesn't get a lot of work because he's a Shakespearean actor. He'd probably be the first one to tell you that. He's a good-looking guy. Right. So right. it's populated with a lot of attractive people that helps you know, the viewer want to care. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of goofy-looking right. Renfield. Goofy-looking guy in it. Oh, I just told you another person. So Ren yeah. Renfield comes back. Renfield d didn't die in, the, in Dracula in this world. Maybe. Okay. Or maybe he came back in a different way. You just have to play the game. You had a you were showing me a manual earlier. Who wrote that and uh and, and what uh, tell me a little bit about that and why why people would buy a manual like that. Well, when you uh when you asked for the interview, uh <laughs> it's been a busy week for myself, so I didn't even look for this book until this morning. And, and remembered that I had it, but this was a manual uh, written by a game critic, uh, and it's a big manual, and it's all about how to get through the game, why you know why uh, Viacom thought there would be a need for the game. Uh, the critic loved the game so much that he wanted the manual to be so comprehensive that he went to Bram Stoker's uh, family, I believe, who, who owned the rights. And the last half of this book is Bram Stoker's Dracula. Legally included is the entire book. At the time when this came out, I remember he sent uh, the producer 
the uh, the letter saying from the Bram Stoker family that no, we approve use of this because Viacom wanted to make sure it was all in the up and up. So I, I know it was legit, but he wanted to make sure it was on the up and up. So yeah, it was a game uh, critic from a magazine that put this all together. It is it was nobody from Viacom, and it's because he loved the game so much. Uh, and and he was part of this fandom that loved the game so much that he wanted to pay it back to to people and and put something together for those who had either never known the game or got halfway through the game, which happens with a lot of video games. Now you get halfway through and you get frustrated because there's that dragon you just can't kill. Right. So they quit playing the game. So he's got some uh, walkthroughs on how to get through different levels, just like there's walkthroughs for any Zelda game that you can find online. It's just, people. it's just another example of how people were so impressed and so affected by Dracula Unleashed at that time that someone would go and write a book on their own about it. Exactly. And apparently it sold a lot of copies. Uh, I think it's still on Amazon. But uh, it's, you know, for people who watch it now, uh, they're going to see it and they're going to say, well, those aren't multi-million dollar sets. No, they're not. I think we had $125,000 for sets, which at the time was a lot. And for people who ever play the game, you're going to see a lot of great mansions sets. But to me, the the set I'm most impressed with is the graveyard that we did inside our studio with all sorts of fog machines and a mausoleum that comes into play. And for the budget we had, it looked pretty darn good. So it's it it still infuriates me at times, and I'm not saying that this is Citizen Kane, <laughs> but but certainly one of my five favorite movies of all time is Citizen Kane, and uh, I first saw it when I was a kid, and it, it was there was so many great moments of it, and I know a lot of people I've bragged about the movie to now, and they're watching, go, oh, what's so special about that? And it's because it was the first time that a lot of those things were done. Mm -hmm. And that's what I get back to with this game. For this game, it was the first time full motion capture was done for a video game. It was the first time a lot of these things with, with all the branching and an open world were in a video game. Is it Witcher 3? It is not. But for something done in the early 90s, it's pretty good. You're the Ramones, and Witcher 3 is My Chemical Romance. Fair? I could Fair? I, I can live with being the Ramones. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You you're you're you're, you're, you're 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 speaking very highly of this game that you directed a long time ago, but I'm am I right in thinking that you don't have any financial interest in it anymore? Oh no. In, I mean, in, you don't get paid anything more just because someone would go out and buy it now, which you can still buy. No, that is correct. No, it, in fact, there was never a time when we were getting a percentage. We we just got our day rate for shooting and editing the whole thing and Viacom took it from there and any any uh, any royalties that they got in fact the actors all just went for a buyout pay rate right? they, they got no royalties so it was only Viacom that made money after it was shot and edited and done or continues to make money and, and in fact Viacom is now purchased by another company I don't even remember who and I'm sure any additional royalties would go to that company but and I'm not, no, I'm not saying that because I think you should be bitter. I, I'm, I'm demonstrating that you're not here because you're trying to plug a game you did 30 years ago. You're, you're expressing pride in something that you were a part of that people are still really into in this day. Well, it, you're right. And it was, we all took pride, the cast and the crew took pride in the creative process. We shot this about six weeks straight you know, 12 to 14 hour days for six straight weeks. And, you know, there was fantastic sets that, that you would shoot and then destroy that night because you had to repurpose some of the, the materials to make a new set the next day. And you would just, you'd almost want to cry because it's this beautiful set that we didn't have the time or money or space to leave it. We had to destroy it and then go on to another set the next day. And, you know, my hat goes off to everybody in the, the crew and the cast, but especially the, the carpenters and the set crew that just made these creative masterpieces 
that you know, imagine spending time with this beautiful painting and then you show it to people and then you destroy it so you can repurpose the canvas. That's what it was like. And uh, so it was very rewarding. Uh, it was a little bittersweet, like I said, when it was all done because we loved the creative outlet for six straight weeks so much that, wait, let's do more. We want to do more. We want to do more. Are there any scars from it? Literal or uh, figurative? Uh, if uh, I, I can take a while to open the book. There's at one point, uh, not only Dracula, but another vampire turns into a wolf. And uh, so we had to hire a real wolf on the set. This wolf comes in and it was about 200 pounds. It was a huge, huge wolf. And the handler, who's this big muscle bone guy who is built like the rock, said, well, we'll have to do something to get him mean because I had to have him when Dracula turns into the wolf, he's got to then snarl at the camera right. and jump out a window of this set that we built where it's a, a balcony that he jumps out the balcony. And if Dracula turned into and, a friendly dog who chased balls and licked himself, that just wouldn't do. That, yeah, that's not a that's, that's not a show. So I, I said, well, how mad, mad will he get? And he goes, well, he can get pretty mad. So we cleared the studio, and it was just myself, uh, the camera operator, a camera, uh, the dog handler, and in the very back of the studio was the dog handler's wife. We had a lock-off shot because it was from where uh, Dracula was, and it's got a lock-off to when he morphs into the wolf. And uh, the, dog, the wolf handler is underneath the wolf, and he says, well, to make him mad, you got to smack him in the snout. And I said, S actually smack him in the snout? And he said, yeah, he'll get mad. And he had a rolled up newspaper. So uh, camera's right there, camera operator's behind me. I'm right next to the camera because we needed the wolf to look just to the side of the camera. And I took this rolled up newspaper and I kind of whacked it in the snout. And in this locked off shot, and it's in the game, you can see the wolf all of a sudden starts snarling and his eyes dilated. And he get so pissed off, he ripped out of the wolf handler's uh, grasp, jumped uh, just to the side of the camera, chomped down on my arm, and there is a scar, scar right here, where he chomped down right on my arm, just, just missed an artery, and uh, immediately looked like uh, he was going to end me. And the wolf handler said, King, release! And he just let go, turned into this lovable pup again. I looked at the camera guy and I said, did you get all that? He said, oh yeah. And it's in, it's in the show. The only, and I, I had a, a little couple of, not even drops of blood. It was just red and, and like a little bit of blood. So nothing bad. The only thing bad that happened was the wolf handler's wife was in the back of the studio. The moment she saw the wolf chopped on my uh, wrist, she fainted hit her head on the back of a sink that's in the back of the studio and she needed stitches. So just for anybody watching this who is concerned about cruelty towards animals, let's just be clear, you got what was coming to you for hitting that wolf with a rolled up newspaper. I completely deserved what I got. Uh, right afterwards, in fact, because I love dogs, as you know very well, I, I said, is he gonna be mad at me forever? And he said, well, he's not gonna hurt you. I said, well, that's not the point. I said, I don't want to be mad at me. She said, oh, no, he's probably already forgot. So I went over, got on my knees. He came over, tail wagging, and I was petting him. And it was literally five minutes after I thought he was going to end me. And no, and no he, permanent injuries to the wolf? No, not at all. Not at all. I got a question from PG Devlin on Twitter, and it's, would you direct this game again? And if so, what would you do differently? Well, PJ, for sure, I would be honored to direct it again. I... Uh, I'm proud, I'm, I'm very happy with every cast member, every crew member. I, I thought most times I brought my A game. There's probably, I, I was creative as uh, technology would allow me to be with camera movement and things of that nature. Uh, at the end, we had no budget. We, we were told we had budget, but we wound up having no budget for this big transformation where, uh, uh, a character transforms into Dracula. 
And that would that is the number one thing I would do over is figured out a way to make that transformation far more memorable. Uh, you went on with your life. You did a lot of other uh, projects on film and video. Uh, but creatively, you didn't really return to horror films quite in that way, did you? You you did other stuff. Oh, uh, some film shoots felt like a horror show because <laughs> they were so arduous. But no, did not do any other horror films uh, or video games after that. Did a lot of comedies, a lot of Renaissance area period piece things, uh, detective stories, a lot of different things, but not the horror genre. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm not the type that goes to a lot of horror movies. To me, a horror movie is like Silence of the Lambs, which is not a horror movie. But that's that's kind of that's kind of more my jam. I'm not a big fan of going to horror movies. There was growing up as a kid. Uh, and this is really dating myself. Uh, long before you were born, on Friday night at midnight on Channel Five was a sh show called Horror Incorporated. And it would be the classics, the the classic Bell Lugosi vampire and and uh, uh, Boris Karloff Frankenstein and the Invisible Man and Lon Chaney's Werewolf and a bunch of those uh, classic iconic horror films that now in this day of uh, Friday the Thirteenth twenty seven or whatever number they're on and. And, you know, that's nothing. You don't see people getting impaled from underneath the bed and stuff like that in in any Bela Lugosi movie. So it's what what is or is not a horror film has evolved in its definition, I think, over time. And and certainly more the what I would call the classics, like I said, the Lugosi and Karloff ones. Those are more the ones that I've always appreciated. I, I love the fact that in Frankenstein, you wind up caring for the monster, which as a kid, as a viewer, I started watching the movie. I was never going to care about that. And that's who I think you're supposed to care about by the end. And and I don't know that with with the Jasons and Freddy Kruegers, I don't know if you're supposed to care, care about them or Jigsaw and Saw or any of those kind of characters. I think they're just supposed to be menaces. Jeffrey Dahmer might be one of them. Yeah, yeah. He, he probably is. Well, gonna... da Dahmer, Dahmer is the the vampire of the, of the day, right? Um, we've romanticized vampires, but now we have serial killers instead. Exactly, exactly. What do you think the uh, the appeal of vampires is? Why do we? Why was Dracula unleashed a success at the time? Why are vampires still a thing here in twenty twenty? Well, I think it's the mystery of. Uh whether you're calling them undead or just immortal, the fact that they can live forever. Uh, I think the fact that they're a mystery, I, I think the, the fact that they're powerful, I think there's a lot of those illusions. I think that the fact that they just plain have cheated death in one way, shape or form that uh, appeals to people. I think it's just the unknown. I think a lot of people like being on the edge of their seat. And, and, and that tingle of being petrified and scared of what's going to happen and what's going to come next. So I think, to me, it's probably a combination of a lot of those things. I also think in terms of, uh, like for our game or Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh, I believe that ultimately the reader is supposed to be reading for Jonathan Harker in the book to... Uh, for he and Quincy Morris to, to kill Dracula. So it's the overcoming that ultimate evil that cannot be killed. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes humanity feel better that there's this big bat out there, but you know what? If we get the team together, we, we can take this big bat on and we can emerge victoriously. So I think it's, it's the allure of all that power and the potential of overcoming that threat. And on that allegory, for humanity overcoming a threat uh, with what we are dealing with today. I think that's a great place to end this interview. Awesome. But let me recap once again. The wolf was not harmed. <laughs> but it's a, you made it for a great story, though, didn't it? It, it made for a great story. It was a, King was a great wolf. And uh, I think that newspaper was hurt more than his snout when the newspaper hit the snout. 
we'll, we'll, we'll pour one out for King. And thank you again, Mike Plant. Thank you very much. Thanks again to Mike Plant for joining us. I'm going to put some links down below to Dracula Unleashed. Uh, you're going to find some emulators that are out there that people have created, uh, some walkthroughs on YouTube if you just want to see what the game looked like, as well as a link to the kind of stuff Mike is working on these days. Thanks again for joining us here on the Toothpickings webcast. Hope you stay safe, stay indoors, and we'll talk to you again soon.